Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our continuing study through the book of Genesis. Let's open in prayer. Well, Father God, we want to thank you as always uh, for your love, your tender care, your Holy Spirit, Lord God, who guides us and leads us as always as we seek to have your wisdom, Lord God, and we seek to, um, Lord, just commit our minds and our hearts and this evening, Lord God, into your hands. I pray that your blessings would flow uh, abundantly on those of us who open our ears and our hearts to your Spirit's guiding, leading, and teaching us, Lord, in your truth. I pray that the book of Genesis would come alive to us, Lord God. We would be able to identify with the people and the characters that are presented and understand the things that they were going through, the decisions they made, um, and how you uh, may have responded to them in those areas, Lord God. And I pray that we would fully understand um, how much you have blessed Abraham as we look at the story of his life here in Genesis and understand how those blessings flow to us as well, even today, Lord. So I thank you for this time. Ask you to be with each of us, Lord God. We welcome you here and ask you to take full authority tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Welcome, welcome. So we, were, uh, we went through last week, we went through the latter part of chapter 12, chapter 13, and almost all of chapter 14, although I left off intentionally the study through the, the two or three verses that cover Melchizedek um, and Ab- Abram's encounter with Melchizedek at that time, because it's a big study, and I want to walk through that. Um, you wouldn't think so by looking at just the book of Genesis, but when we actually understand all that's uh, going on there with Melchizedek, uh, it's a very big foreshadow of the life of Christ as our high priest. And so we're going to take a look at that little carve out from chapter 14. Um, And then tonight, with all luck, we will finish chapter 15, which is when most people think of the Abrahamic covenant, they're thinking of chapter 15. Um, It actually spans about five chapters total, uh, but um, chapter 15 is where the main event takes place, if you will, and we'll take a look at that tonight. And then we will also take a look at uh, the whole episode with Hagar and Ishmael being born and all that happens there in chapter 16. So with that, let's jump in with these three verses or two verses, uh, three verses actually, in Genesis 14, starting in verse 18, talking about Melchizedek. So if you recall, if you were here or um, want some refreshers, So chapter 14 is basically dealing with the battle of those nine kings. There was a a group of kings from the south in Mesopotamia, four kings, predominantly led by Keterleomer, and they came and they conquered and took authority and made captives of five city-state kingdoms in the um, area of the Jordan River uh, on the other side of Israel or Canaan. And they, you know, put them under subjugation. It was about a 12 to 14 year period that all that was taking place. Um, and it, those Jordanian cities or if, along the Jordan River, uh, they got captured. The two most famous ones would be Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, Lot was living there in Sodom after he separated from Abraham or Abram in chapter 13. Um, so the end result was Keterleomer, with his coalition of forces, conquers these five kingdom uh, city kings in the northern region there and carry Lot away captive. Abraham gets word from one of the escapees that his nephew Lot has been taken captive. So he pursues Keterleomer and the rest of the gang uh, up to the north as they're headed back down the fer- fer- Fertile Crescent, back down into Mesopotamia, and Abraham actually is victorious over these kings who were victorious over those other five kings, um, regains Lot, regains, regains all of the possessions or takes the spoils of the battles of war um, as victor. And um, right at the, at the tail end of that, he then encounters Melchizedek, which we'll read here. And then we, we covered last week again is, of course, he had the spoils of war, But then the king of Sodom comes out and says, you know, you can keep the spoils. Can you at least give us back our people, the residents of our city? And Abraham gives him back not only the people, but everything. And he says, you know, far be it that anybody think that you made me rich. It's God who made me rich. And so he turns everything back over to those kings. So sandwiched in the middle of that whole narrative account is this encounter with Melchizedek. So starting in chapter 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. 
And he was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all, meaning Abraham or Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. All of these things, virtually every word phrase in this whole little three verse section is super important to New Testament theology under Christ, and we'll talk about that. So, Abraham or Abram meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek, just as we walk through all of the information that's here, Mel, uh, Melchizedek is a compound Hebrew word meaning king of righteousness. Okay? Uh, Melek, the first part of the word, is a Hebrew word for king. You'll see that in a multitude of places if you, you know, see in Scripture. So king of this, king of that, or you know, David the king. The, the, the word for king or royalty there is Melek. Uh, Zedek means righteousness. So literally they squish the two words together in Hebrew and say Melchizedek is literally the king of righteousness. And then as, he, as introduced here is also the king of Salem, the place called Salem. Uh, and Salem is the same, really, the Hebrew word of shalom, meaning peace. So he's literally the king of righteousness and the king of peace, um, as we see here, king of the city called peace. So in Genesis, he's also uh, declared to be priest of the Most High God. So we're adding more and more and more details to his resume with every phrase that is uttered here in Genesis. King of righteousness, king of peace, king of, uh, king of peace, and the priest of the most high God, or God most high. And as king and priest, Melchizedek brought out bread and wine to serve Abram. And that should strike familiar with what we do, at least in this church on a monthly basis. We talk about sharing the bread and the wine together and the communion meal. All of these things are intentional by the Holy Spirit several thousand years before Christ was born, foreshadows of the, the work and the ministry and the characteristics of Jesus Christ himself. And we'll walk through more of that in a minute. So in Hebrews, Paul picks up on everything that we're seeing here in Genesis 18, or 14, 18 through 20. And he makes a really significant theological observation right off the bat. And that is that Melchizedek appears in this narrative account in Genesis without any mention of his heritage or genealogy. So he'll say in Hebrews 7, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. He has no genealogy of any record kind. Now that should strike us as surprising, having come out of Genesis chapter 5, where we saw the 10 generations from Adam to Noah, and then we come out of chapter 10 and 11, and we see those generations from Noah and Shem all the way down to uh, Terah, who was the father of Abram. And so we see all these genealogies listed, not to mention the table of nations there in chapter 10. And Melchizedek isn't even mentioned anywhere. So he's first mentioned and only mentioned in Genesis 14. And Paul makes a really big theological point out of that whole no account of his genealogy because it was intentionally left off by the Holy Spirit so that he would be a model or type of Jesus Christ, who would obviously come later, who also doesn't need, from a divine perspective, to have any kind of heritage or genealogy, because he's God. He is, uh, is eternal. Uh, be, like Jesus himself says to, in John 8, right? Before Abraham was, I am, I exist. So um, Paul makes a really big point of that in Hebrews. Of course, I always think Paul is the author of Hebrews, if it confuses you in any way. Melchizedek um, it blessed Abram um, of, or you might say, by or to or for God Most High. There, that, that Hebrew um, word there can be in any one of those uh, things. So, so Melchizedek blessed Abram of God Most High. Well, that means in one sense, Abram is a servant or the one receiving the blessing of God Most High. But it could also be that, Ab that Melchizedek is blessing Abram by, like it, God is instructing, because he's the priest of God, he's, God is instructing the blessing to flow to Abram. Or the blessing is reaffirmed, here Melchizedek is reaffirming that God is offering his blessing to Abraham or for Abraham. All of those, can, you know, all of those prepositional phrases kind of work there. 
Melchizedek declared that God is possessor of heaven and earth. Well, that's true, but man tends to think that we possess heaven and earth in some way or another. But Melchizedek is affirming that all of it belongs to God. And so he actually has the full capacity and authority to give Abram the land that he has been speaking of all this time. So God has this rightful claim over all of creation, of course, as creator. And whatever wealth or inheritance Abraham or Abram has is truly a gift from God. So Abram has nothing that wasn't granted to him as a gift, as a gift or a blessing from God's hand. Okay. And that would include uh, that he is also had his victory over his enemies, which would include Keterleomer and all that it took to get his nephew Lot back out of captivity. So we can note that while Abraham received these blessings without ever speaking, a record, he has recorded here a word to Melchizedek. So he just shows up, and we, you know, we assume they had a conversation, but it's not recorded, any words that Abram spoke back to Melchizedek. Uh, but Melchizedek acted on Abram's behalf because he's the priest. What does a priest do? He represents the people before God. Right? That's what a priest, whether it's the high priest, whether it's Aaron or any other priest, they represent the people before God. They take the people's petitions and the people's sinful conduct, but covered in blood and get God's grace or his atonement by going before God as the, high, as the priest. And so Melchizedek is doing this for Abraham. He is um, representing God's blessing to Abram, and he is al allowing Abram to kind of connect with God Most High in a way that Abram couldn't do directly because he needed a mediator. He needed an intercessor. Uh, and we see the importance of that again in the book of Hebrews as well as in the overall New Testament. And then, concluding the account here in Genesis 14, Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all that he had. And I believe this is more than just the spoils he picked up in the war. I believe this was Abram's first opportunity to say, God has blessed me with all this abundance of wealth. Remember, we saw that last week. He came out of Egypt with much gold and silver and livestock and all of the sort of measures of wealth. And now he has an opportunity to say, God, I don't, want, I, I don't make claim that I am worthy of all of this material wealth. I want to offer it back to you. And so he gives him a tithe of, I think, all that he had. Okay. And of course, tithe literally means a tenth portion of all. So he, you know, in some way or another, mathematically looked at what he had and made sure that he was giving God this tenth portion of everything that he had. So, of course, this is the first mention of the word tithe, or actually any financial offering. Now, we saw you know, Cain and, makes, Cain and Abel make sacrifices and, you know, on the altar and all of that. And, of course, there's some material or uh, financial implications to that. But this is really the first, you know, specific statement that a human being offered God material response for his, uh, the blessings that they felt that they had received from him. So Abram gives him this financial offering back to God. Um, but notice that this free will offering of Abram, called the tithe, comes 500 years before the law. You know, so we get, you know, lots and lots of... Uh, People, and it's not going to be a lesson on tithing or anything like that, but we get a lot of people who go, oh, tithing, that's the law. That's Old Testament law type stuff, and that's been done away with. Well, this is Abram, and Abram is not under the Mosaic law that came 500 years later. Abram is giving God a financial in, you know, a response to the blessings that he knows he receives from God, and he wants to offer it back. And, and from this moment on, the tithe becomes sort of the default standard of what material offerings back to God would be, Old Testament and also carrying forward into the New Testament. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's just a, a starting point. Uh, if you look in the rest of the law, there's all kinds of other opportunities to give God or give the priests who serve God some type of offering from the wealth of our increase. Uh, but it starts with the tithe level, the 10% level. So, as I said, Abram was not offered to, or obligated to offer a tithe under the law, of course, because it hasn't been established yet. 
Um, instead, this freely offered from what was in his heart to give uh, through God's appointed mediator. So we can talk, again, we can talk about the importance of the principle of tithing and all of that, but if we're not giving from our heart, then it's really not, it has anything to do with a relationship from God. So if somebody feels compelled or, or constrained in some way to make a financial offering to God through, the, through in this case, in a modern day church or whatever, um, if it's done from compulsion or obligation, you know, the church will receive it because we, we don't know your heart, but God does, and God's not very impressed with, you know, a begrudging giver. He actually wants to see a cheerful giver, and one who gives in such exuberance that they're just happy to give back to God because they know and recognize that it came from God in the first place. So the principle of offering God a designated portion of income or wealth has support then in both the Old and New Testaments, um, in, which continues on into the modern-day church, despite uh, some people's uh, bristling at that concept. So the importance uh, uh, of the account of Abram's encounter with Melchizedek to the New Testament theology uh, really cannot be overstated. I cannot tell you in these three verses here in Genesis 14 how important Melchizedek is into New Testament theology, but I'll try to give you some highlights of what I, how I see it um, here tonight. So the only other place in the Old Testament that Melchizedek is referenced or named is in Psalm 110, verse 4. I'll read that here in a moment. Where God the Father swore by an unbreakable oath that Jesus, the Messiah, would assume the role of high priest forever according to this manner or order of Melchizedek. So here's what it says. Yahweh has sworn, and he will not relent. You, speaking of the Messiah, speaking of Jesus Christ, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So if you add the three verses from Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 verse 4, you go, without the New Testament, you might say, what are we doing with this? You know, if, it, if Psalm 110 didn't show up, we would probably say, Hmm, Melchizedek, that's a very interesting character. Not very memorable, let's just move on. And then you look at David writing Psalm 110, and David writes about how the Lord has sworn and he will not relent that the Messiah will be priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And you go, oh, wait a minute, there's something really important there. But then we get to the New Testament, and we would completely miss the importance of this again with the exception of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is the only New Testament book that dedicates any, um, you know, even a verse, but much more than that in Hebrews, to Melchizedek. And it's really foundational to really the underpinning of about six or eight chapters in the book of Hebrews. Uh, this whole concept that God has appointed his son, the Messiah, to be a high priest, not according to Aaron, not under the law, but under the order of Melchizedek, who appeared in Genesis to Abraham. So, Jesus, the Messiah, would assume the role of high priest, and again, not taking that role from any lineage back to Levi and Aaron. In fact, he couldn't. He would have been prohibited from it if he were trying to do it under the law. Okay. But from the central uh, and uh, from the eternal typology that was established by Melchizedek. Remember, Melchizedek has no beginning, no end, no genealogy, all those things are apparent, and they all pertain to Jesus Christ. Now, as I just mentioned, it would be impossible for Jesus to be high priest according to the law, because the law of Moses did not permit a king to serve as priest, or a priest to serve as king. So if Jesus is going to be king of kings, lord of lords, and high priest, he can't do it under the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was very clear about whether or not, you know, who, that only the tribe of Levi and only the descendants of Aaron of the tribe of Levi could serve as high priest or in the priesthood role. And it, it was very clear from Genesis uh, 48 that we'll look at when we get there that the royal tribe was the tribe of Judah. And so you have two very different tribes, and there was no mixing of that. If you're, either a, if you're from Judah, you can be a king, if you're from Levi or Aaron, you can be a priest, but you can't do both. But Christ was not, and Melchizedek, like Melchizedek, 
was unconstrained by the law of Moses, which came 500 years later, and clearly here, as, as represented in Genesis 14, Melchizedek was Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest of God Most High. So that's why Jesus had to go through the law or beyond the law back to the Melchizedekian priesthood in order for him to be in the roles that were appointed for him to be king, priest forever. So Melchizedek, of course, was no ordinary king. He was the king of righteousness, and he was the king of peace. These are not accidental descriptions or titles for Melchizedek. He's literally described as the king of righteousness and the king of peace because he's a foreshadow of the true king of peace, Jesus Christ, who would come 2,000 years after his first appearance or after Melchizedek shows up to Abram. Now, additionally, because Melchizedek had no recorded birth or death, he, of course, perfectly modeled the true ministry of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal king and high priest. So everything about Melchizedek perfectly foreshadows or perfectly models what we see in the New Testament about Christ being a priest and the king of kings who will rule and reign over all. So without the Genesis 14 and, and or Psalm 110 accounts, there would be no basis for linking Jesus to the role of high priest. But Paul does, clearly does this in the book of Hebrews, right? So we would, God doesn't do anything without, except what he reveals to us through the scriptures, through the words prophetically. So in, without Melchizedek, for us to recognize we need, a, we need a high priest who lives forever, like Hebrews 7 and other places in Hebrews talks about, we need that to be Jesus, but we also need Jesus to be king. We need him to come from the tribe of David, just like it was prophesied that, to David that he would have a son to sit on his throne forever and ever, and his kingdom would be established as an everlasting kingdom. We just can't mix these two prophetic roles except outside of the law and except in the order established under Melchizedek. So it's really, I hope you're getting that, it's really important to the person of Christ and our understanding of his ministry. So Jesus' service as high priest is essential for salvation. I mean, we may not catch this, but it really is. You gotta, we got to delve deeply into our study in the book of Hebrews to see it's not just that he died on the cross, it's not just that he shed his blood, it's that he then takes his blood as a sacrifice, as an offering, and he takes it as high priest into the holy of holies in heaven, offers his blood there for all of our sins, and then God receives that and gives full, not just atonement for our sins, but he fully washes away our sins because of the offering made by our high priest. If Aaron wasn't permitted to enter into heaven, right? So you take the, uh, the iconic Aaronic high priest. Aaron ministered on an earthly tabernacle made with human hands that was imperfect by nature because it was made by man. He wasn't welcomed up into heaven to make a sacrifice up into heaven because he was a sinner, just like you and I. And so we needed a sinless high priest to enter into heaven to offer perfect blood sacrifice, human blood, not animal blood, and that could only be done by a perfect man. And that, so we needed Jesus to fulfill that role as high priest, okay? but we also need him to be our king of kings and, so, and, and the son of David and all that goes along with that. So again, the offering can only be made by a perfect man who offered his own perfect blood as a legitimate atoning sacrifice for man's sins. So therefore, this encounter between Abram and Melchizedek was absolutely not some chance encounter. God had appointed this critical meeting between the two men, uh, and uh, uh, two of, let's say, the most theologically essential men who ever lived. Abram represents the blessing that God offered by faith. So Abram gets called the father of faith. That's really important. Jesus, Paul, Peter, all of the New Testament writers make a very big deal of that we link our spiritual heritage to Abraham, the father of faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God, and therefore we have no relationship with him. 
So Abram is incredibly theologically important. But having a high priest who has the access to enter into heaven, who lives forever to always live to make intercession for us, as Hebrews 7 talks about, we also needed that. And so two of the most important theological men and actual you know, flesh and blood real men who ever lived had this meeting in Genesis 14 to demonstrate faith and the necessity of a blood sacrifice to be made right with God. I don't think we can really, like I said, overstate how important Melchizedek is, um, especially in his encounter with a very specific person of history who all people of faith tie our heritage back to, and that's Abraham. So in this account, it's clear that Melchizedek is the greater of the two men. Okay? The book of Hebrews expands on that truth again to indicate that salvation comes by faith in the superior work of Christ and not by the genealogical linkage that any one of us might have to Abraham. So this is established because Abram offers ties to Melchizedek. That indicates with certainty that Melchizedek was considered the higher in relationship to Abraham. And people go, wait a minute, I thought Abraham was God's, you know, the one that God blessed. He called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and all of these. Well, when the, by function, when Abram offers him a tithe, he's clearly indicating Melchizedek as priest of God most high is in a higher position or role with God than he is. Okay? And it's also clear also reaffirmed in Hebrews 7, that it was Melchizedek who offered the blessing to Abraham. And Paul says in Hebrews that without any contradiction, the lesser is always blessed by the greater. And so, again, we see that Abram, while he has a very important figure in our entire narrative and uh, theological history, Melchizedek is presented as greater than Abraham, and that's really important theologically as it develops in the New Testament exclusively to the book of Hebrews. So the Holy Spirit's authorship of Scripture, I think, is fully on display when you really consider what happened here in Genesis 14. This was planned from before the foundation of the world. This was planned that Melchizedek would encounter Abram on this return from a battle of the, of the nine kings, he specifically instructed Moses, I believe, how to write the narrative account with only the right specific details. Don't say anything about his heritage, even if you could determine what it was. Just say, he appears and he blesses. Abraham is considered the lesser of the two men, and he serves as king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of God most high, and everything will else get sorted out 2,000 years later when Christ comes to fulfill those uh, prophecies of him that we would see right here. So there's no indication in Genesis that this meeting had prophetic implications. If you're just reading Genesis, you would have no, uh, no recognition that this is a prophetic utterance or prophetic account of this encounter between Abram and Melchizedek. However, every detail, as I've tried to point out in this really short narrative, of Genesis 14, 18 through 20, is used to explain the superior ministry of Jesus over the Aaronic priesthood, which comes 500 years later. This is super important to say Jesus always had a higher priestly role than Aaron had, because it's on a different order. It came from, while well, the law can pass away, the law can become obsolete, as, again, Hebrews talks about, the priesthood that was modeled or typified by Melchizedek continues long after the law has reached its zenith and reached its obsolescence point. So here's some other things, you know, again, just summarize again how important this is and how it clearly shadows or foreshadows typologically Jesus Christ, right from Genesis 14. King of righteousness, well, who, if I said, walked up to any Christian on the street and said, who's the king of righteousness, what are they going to say? Jesus, right? Oh, that, yeah, it's Melchizedek, but it's Jesus. King of peace, who's that? Well, that's going to be Jesus. Bread and, if I said, who's a high priest or who's the f central figure who offered bread and wine to uh, those people who he was serving 
you would say Jesus offered bread at the Last Supper. He broke the bread, he, drank, he gave the cup, bread and wine. Okay, you'd think Jesus. Priest of the, I said, you know, who's the high priest today in, in, in the church? Who's the high priest or priest of God Most High? We would say, based on knowledge from Hebrews, that it's Jesus. He's our heavenly high priest who serves before God. Um, he's the greater. He's greater than Melchizedek, but Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, the father of faith. So we're seeing a order. So it's important for the church, for believers, it would have been important in those you know, narr- or those encounters with the Pharisees with Jesus um, in the Gospels for them to recognize that Melchizedek had a higher functional authority role than Aaron or any of the Aaronic priests had okay, because of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, also Jesus, blesses the one who received God's promises by faith. Right? So who are we? We are people as believers, receive God's promises of eternal life and everything else he's promised to us by faith, well, where do we receive the blessing? We get it from Christ. Christ blesses us. He intercedes for us. He serves as our priest before a holy and righteous God. God Most High and, of course, his high priest deliver the faithful from their enemies, and the greatest of all the enemies is death, as it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, right? So the, the last enemy to be destroyed in God's victory over all, sin, death, and everything that's entered the world through the garden event is death. That's the last enemy of man to be destroyed is death. And God and God's high priest will deliver us from our number one enemy, death. Okay? Not that this mortal body won't suffer death, but we, we will all suffer the first death, but Revelation and other places say we as believers won't suffer the second death. The important death is the second one, not the first death. And so it's not an accident that this encounter happens right after Abram had a victory, kind of an unparalleled or unexpected victory. Here's a, here's a shepherd or a, or a you know, sojourner in the land of Canaan with no land and no city to live in, and, and somehow... He can garner up 318 people of his own household to go and fight a battle and win a victory over military rulers of his age. And he can recognize that it's God who gave him the victory. And we can recognize that it's God that gives us the victory over our greatest enemy, which is death. And that comes from the Melchizedekian role that Jesus serves in. Okay, so I I hope that was presented in a way that makes it clear really how important this story is or this account is in Genesis. And not only that, to me it just it, it, it is such a testimony to the Holy Spirit's foreknowledge of all events and how he sets up things hundreds or thousands of years in advance so that we will recognize his working, his handiwork, and his foreknowledge once it gets fulfilled later down the road, like in our case, you know, more than 2,000 years after Abraham, Melchizedek, and 1,500 years after Moses. So anyway, hope that's uh, that clear. It's an exciting subject for me. I really like Melchizedek um, because he is such a true foreshadow of the person and the ministry work of Jesus Christ. But we'll move on. So let's uh, jump into chapter 15. So this is the covenant chapter, right? This is the one, like I said, uh, if you're going to think about the Abrahamic covenant, even though it's it's stated in chapter 13, it's going to be stated here in chapter 15, again in chapter 17, again in chapter uh, 22, right? It's um, it's really the chapter 15 is really where the meat and potatoes of the uh, of the covenant start to get established between God and Abraham or Abram. All right, so let's read through, uh, starting in Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, so after the encounter with Melchizedek and the returning of the spoil to the king of Sodom, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, What will you give me, seeing I go childless, 
and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born of my house is my heir. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, shall, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in Yahweh and he, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. We'll pick up that part of it here in a minute. But I want to get into the kind of the preamble or the conversation uh, that starts off the formalizing actions under the covenant. So it says, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision. Well, here we're a book, in the book of Genesis. We love to point out the first mention of things. This is the first mention of someone receiving a vision from God. Okay? We've had conversations with God. We, we see clearly there was a conversation with uh, God in the garden with Adam and Eve. And we see conversation with Cain before and after he murders his brother Abel. We obviously saw some design information given to Noah to build the ark. Um, and we heard, of course, that when Abram was living in Ur of the Chaldeans, he got this call, come out of the country in your father's house to a land I will show you. But this is the first time it's been described as a communication through or by means of a vision. So this is a really, and it's also the first explanation of how God communicates with people, or one of the means or media by which God communicates with people. So while it is helpful to know uh, Abram had a vision from Yahweh, the term used there does not offer any specific details as to what the vision from God looked like or sounded like. Okay? We don't know. Was, it a, you know. was he awake? Was he literally seen? Uh, some type of shadowy or, or smoky image of God? Or was it more all inside the cranium? He could close his eyes and he could see things going on in his eyes. Again, we're not given enough information here to, and I'm not certain that all prophetic visions or communications by visions from God would take on the same characteristics for every person. Okay. So we just get to use the word vision, but we don't really, doesn't give us any clarity as to what but like if you were Abraham, what you would, have, you would have experienced in seeing this vision from God. Or certainly me either. So by, but by means of this vision, whatever it kind of manifested itself to Abram in, Abram could have, we, we could see from the vision that Abram could have lucid two-way communications directly with Yahweh. Right? So he's lucid, he has you know, the ability to communicate, whether it's verbally or through you know, mental thoughts. Um, he has the ability to communicate, hear what God is saying to him. He responds back to God or Yahweh, and Yahweh responds back to him in another reply. So there's some kind of true conversation happening here. But again, it's described as occurring within the framework of a prophetic vision or communication vision. So Yahweh opens the vision that he gave to Abram by declaring that he is Abram's shield and his exceedingly great reward. Well, let's talk about a couple of these things a little bit. The shield is obviously a defensive barrier, and sometimes the Hebrew word there could also be used for scales of a crocodile, okay, which work pretty well if you're going to construct like a shield and you kind of kind of layer it into you know some type of scaly type you know structure. Works well to make a shield in that way, and certainly a crocodile is pretty well protected from his environments or hers. Uh, you know, so it's a defensive weapon or defensive barrier, and Yahweh promises that he will protect Abram on every side, and he will allow no weapon to come against him. That's an incredible vision, an incredible promise, right? To know that God has me in his grip, and he will not allow anything 
to come against me if I'm Abram, because he is promised by his own words, I am your shield, I will protect you, I will cover you. So now we're starting to see the reality of how Abram won the victory over Keterleomer, because God was his shield, God was his protector in the midst of that battle, and God is, going, is promising here, and it's without end, without termination, and even without conditions, Abram is being promised that God will always protect him. Okay. That's an incredible... I, we, mo, we don't walk around like that. Well, what could we do if we walk around going, God is always my shield. I can go into any you know, uh, place of danger, and I can preach the gospel, and I can do this, and I can do that, and God will just protect me. I don't think we have the same promise on us that Abram had directly from God. Uh, he, God will protect us. God will welcome us into eternity, but I don't think we can as, as, assume that, that every one of us gets the same promise. We've had, you know, Pastor Tim Remington here in town get shot in his own church parking lot. Uh, there was that pastor down in Arizona, what, three months ago or so, that got shot by preaching the gospel on the street corner. You know, we don't have that same kind of protection promise that Abraham had. Uh, but it doesn't mean we should live in fear. It just means that Abram had a really special blessing that God starts off this uh, covenant this conversation with. So he should have been somewhat fearless in his uh, conduct, you would think. It doesn't play out that way, but that's how he should have been. So Yahweh declared that he would not allow external harm to come against Abram. Any harm Abram experienced would be a result of his lack of trust in Yahweh's promises. Okay. The, the, any harm that Abram experiences, and we're going to see some things that he harms himself with, if you will, it's not because God wasn't shielding him and protecting him. It's because Abram wasn't fully living by understanding and confidence that God will fulfill his promises and that God will protect me. We already saw the, the problem of him passing his wife off as his sister, because he feared what was going to happen, that the Egyptians would kill him. That should have been an unfounded fear. But now he's got this promise that Yahweh will be his shield, and he's, guess what? He's going to do it again before Abimelech. Okay, we'll see that in a couple of chapters. So he should have been fully confident. But, but the choices and decisions that Abraham makes that seem from our, at least my, reading of the narrative account not good decisions that Abraham makes subsequent to chapter 15, it actually starts off in the next chapter, are because he's not really living by trust that Yahweh will fulfill the promises and protect him in these things. But Yahweh further promised to be Abram's exceedingly great reward. Yahweh it says here, I believe, he will reward Abram to the highest degree possible. Exceedingly great reward, Abram. Now, Abram's already sort of, you know, super rich, seems to have need of nothing, okay? But he's, we, Yahweh is saying, I'm going to be your exceedingly great reward. He's talking about land and material promises coming to Abram, as well as, of course, we know he's already told him that you're going to have descendants more numerable than you could count. So what, what does Abraham lack? Well, he lacks land and a house, but other than that, he's pretty much got the world by, a, uh, by everything Yahweh has to offer him. So, uh, really, in unmatched strength, okay, um, like uh, the love of Yahweh, like we talk about this concept of exceedingly great. It was like in Deuteronomy 6.5, we were supposed to love the Lord our God with all our strength, okay, with exceedingly great strength is how we're, it's described that we're supposed to love the Lord our God. And this is exact the same language that Yahweh is saying, I will be your exceedingly great reward, Abram, exceedingly strong. Above all, above all things we could ever imagine, Yahweh is promising Abram to be his exceeding reward. And Abram's reward will be the highest point. Another, another way of looking at it, is if you, no matter what you have, you go, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, scale of 1 to 100, whatever the scale is. When, when, Ab when Yahweh says to Abram, I will be your exceedingly great reward, he's saying, whatever the highest point on any scale is, you're at the top. Or, or my, my rewards to you will be at the very, very top of that scale. 
So whatever you can think of as a scale, all the way to the full, all the way to the top, all the way to the max, this is the language that God is speaking to Abram, I will be at the top. You're not just going to be rich or, or filled with the rewards of being blessed by me. It'll be at the very, very, very top of anybody's scale of what that would look like. That seems like a lot. Seems like quite the blessing. In other words, Abram's rewards will be incalculable. He just simply would, he, won't, he will have incalculable number of descendants, and he will have incalculable numbers of rewards, whether it's financial or otherwise, that come from his relationship with God. Five, Abram's faithfulness would be rewarded both in temporal and eternal states. So right here on earth, Abram is going to receive exceedingly great rewards, but we're, we're going to know from here, and again we could go back to like Hebrews chapter 6, and say that he, it, it didn't occur to receive all of God's promises until after he died. Then he received all the, full, the fullness of the measure of everything that God wanted to give him. Okay, because it was after he died that he received the full, full measure of the promises. But, it doesn't, but still on earth, he was to receive both. So it's a, I'd like to have that contract or that covenant. Abram had a good one. Abram responded with uh, questions, though. So here's, Abr- here's Yahweh telling Abraham, I'm going to multiply your descendants. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to be your shield. Nothing will come against you that's, that doesn't go through me first. And I will give you exceedingly great to the top of the scale rewards. And Abram responds and says, um, you know, he says, I don't really have need for additional material goods and wealth. He's already quite wealthy. He's like, that wasn't really on my, you know, you're not scratching an itch that I have, God. I've got lots of wealth. That's not really what I'm looking for. So he had more wealth than he needed, and probably more of it was more of a burden to him than a, than a blessing in some ways. Okay. So he, uh, he seemed to believe he would eventually die with a significant amount of wealth, but his concern is, I don't have an heir to leave my inheritance to. So what good is all this wealth if I can't leave it to an heir? Now, to you and I, you know, we joke around in our, our culture, maybe not us directly, but our culture, you know, we'll put bumper stickers on our car and say, you know, I'm, I'm spending my children's or grandchildren's inheritance, you know, trying to, you know, spend all the money. Well, in this culture, one of the greatest things that a person felt they could do was to leave a legacy, was to have an offspring and to set those offspring up very, very well with land and wealth so that they could live as a legacy to you after you died. Um, And so Abram is looking at it and saying, I got so much wealth, I can't use it, I can't spend it in my lifetime. I'm already, you know, in my mid-70s, and I can't spend it in my entire lifetime. And so what good is it to me to get more wealth if I don't have an heir? So he's having this dialogue with God about his needs. So he's, he's kind of looking past the protection promise. He's looking past the wealth and material blessings promise, he's saying, and he he might even say, well, look, you're going to, you know, you're going to count my servants in my household as my heirs, and that's my legacy. Well, that doesn't mean as much to me, God, as maybe, you know, you're you're claiming it does. And so he's having this dialogue, somewhat of a complaint, saying, without an heir, my life is incomplete or unfulfilled. So there's nothing wrong with providing an inheritance to servants. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. He's not saying, look, I just, you know, this would be the worst you know, thing that ever happened to me to have to leave some wealth to people who, who work for me for all their life. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying the blessing is to be able to have an heir that I can gift or leave an inheritance to when I die. So Abram had little interest in gaining more wealth to, to simply bless his longest tenured servant, who he names as Eliezer. Abram then blames God, whoops, blames God for not giving him offspring to share these blessings with. All right, so let's focus on Eliezer for just a moment. So Eliezer means God is help or perhaps God's helper. And I believe it's a possible prophetic link to the Holy Spirit, Eliezer being God's helper, which is really the name there, um, and we'll see, uh, we'll pick up that kind of account, so I'll just ask you to tuck that away, 
for a few weeks when we pick up the big events in chapter 22, which is Abraham offering his son Isaac. And then in chapter 24, where Isaac is, you know, given a bride and how the, how the Eliezer, the, the, the servant there, goes and picks a bride for Abraham's son. There's lots of uh, oh, just rich and dripping with prophetic implications um, in those two accounts. And the fact that Eliezer is the uh, eldest servant in Abraham's household, and his name means God's helper, is going to be important when we get to chapter 22 and chapter 24. So, but getting back to our story here, Yahweh responded to Abram's inquiry about his lack of an heir and his Eli- and the servant named Eliezer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think when we look back in chapter 13, I think that was part of the, the reason why there was that division or separation. I think, I think God was making it clear that Lot and Abram couldn't continue to share their domiciles, their, their whole livestock area. And so once Lot separates, I think there was a true separation that, you know, that's not an error. And according to the ancient customs, a man who died without a legitimate heir, his goods were deeded to his, the eldest servant in his household. Okay. Um, and so he's just, he's just basically re- reiterating the law or the practice of his day that would say, if you can't gift, you know, you know what, what, does, what does the state do with your goods if you die and you don't have an heir? It, it would, the pr- practice or tradition is to give it to the eldest servant if you had one who w- worked in your household. You know, if you don't have a servant, then you probably don't have a lot of material goods and it doesn't really matter. But in this case, that was just... So I think the chapter 13 account was God moving Lot out from Abraham's sight as being someone who would be a, a, a legitimate substitute for an heir. And I think God was intentionally trying to show Abraham, you need an heir, and you're going to need a miracle to get an heir, and I'm going to be the one who provides your heir to you well past the age of childbirth for both you and your wife. So, good question, though. All right. So, so he declared that Eliezer, so God, in response to Abram, says, Eliezer's not going to be the heir. That's not the plan, okay? just as Lot would not be the heir, right? So we already saw how God, like I said, separated Lot from Abram. Now he's going to say, make specific statement, no, Abram, Eliezer will not be your heir because I will give you a descendant from your own body. So, and he specifically says that that's how it would work, that he, down the road, he would get an heir that comes from his own body. So having an heir or offspring was the one thing, I believe, Abram lacked in his current situation. All the world's material possessions could not be a substitute for Abraham not having a child of his own. Okay. Um, and so Yahweh brought him outside at night. I don't know. We don't know what's going on here with the vision or whatever. But he brings Abram outside and he declares that Abram's descendants would be just as uncountable as the stars in the heavens. Which is why I think it might have been at night, right? Because he's, you know, come outside with me, Abram. You're having this vision. Come outside look up, and of course they don't have all the light pollution that we have in a, you know, cities today, look up and count, see if you can count those stars, Abram. Your descendants will be more numerable or, or so innumerable that if, if you can't count the stars I put in the sky, you won't be able to number the descendants that I will give you. Okay. So I presume it was at night. It doesn't say it in the text. So, but in response to this, we get one of the greatest statements in at least the book of Genesis and picked up again in the book of, in multiple books in the New Testament, is that Abram believed in Yahweh's promises and God accounted Abram's faith as though it made him perfectly righteous. That is one of the, the most fundamental of all Christian doctrines around um, and we'll, we'll unpack that here as we go, uh, that Abram believed God's promises and God counted Abram's belief as if he was perfectly righteous, even though he's a sinner. Okay. 
So Yahweh crediting uh, righteousness to Abram because of his belief in God's promises is really the central theological doctrine of the New Testament. You've been saved by grace through faith, all these things. Why? Because God, in his transaction, the currency of God's divine economy is faith. And so he's using it like, you know, a banker or an accountant deals with books and ledgers and all of those kind of uh, imageries that are happening there. So, of course, no one, no one, not Adam to us and beyond, no one is righteous with the exception of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, perfect righteousness is required for eternal life. We must have perfect righteousness to in, in enter into eternal life. God will not accept us if we don't have perfect righteousness. So, it seems impossible unless God uses his accounting currencies to wipe out our debt and put it on Christ and take Christ's perfect debt-free righteousness and accredit it to our account. It's the only way it works. So Yahweh promises to use the currency of faith to clear guilty sinners. Our guilt gets cleared and to credit Christ's righteousness to their account because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Uh, Paul in Romans 4 makes a huge theological statement about this, right? We have to recognize that it's, it's been granted to us, credited like an accountant credits somebody else paying our debt for us and says, your debt has been paid in full. But not only that, he accounts or he uh, gives us the righteousness of Christ. It's, it's uh, imputed righteousness is the term. He imputes the righteousness of Christ to us and the, the currency that allows that to occur is faith. It's the most important concept in all of New Testament theology. It must be accomplished by faith and faith alone. So Genesis 15, 6 here and Habakkuk 2, 4, I believe, are the, are the essential litmus tests of Christian doctrine against all false teaching, teachings that require men in any way, shape, or form to earn salvation by good works. Okay. We know these verses, most of us probably know these verses like right off the top without even having to say them. That's why I didn't put them in here. John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2.8, for you've been saved by grace, not of works, right? Through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? We were saved by faith through grace, or grace through faith, not of works. And Romans 10, 9 and 10, of course, you know, um, if you believe in your heart and you confess through your lips that Jesus, that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. So we've got these verses that are all central to how you get saved or how you stay saved are all dealing with the currency of faith. Um, let's see. So, and then I can't, that got put off the screen there. But uh, this, the importance of that being declared as righteous is repeated. Can you guys see it? I can't see it. Um, well, let's just look at it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, I guess I thought I had it. Let me see. Huh? Can you see it on the paper? Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I, I should always bring a paper up here. What does it say? What's the bottom of it say? Right. I thought I put those in here, but it looks like I didn't. So, all right. Um, you can look those up on your own or whatever after the break here. All right. Actually, let's take that break, and I will, um, I'll grab my own scriptures, and we'll come back to them after, the, after a couple-minute break here. Then we'll start the next section in Genesis 15.